Welcome to the split infinitive world of English grammar. I'm Galila Azaris. As a famous English teacher once remarked on his deathbed, dying is easy, grammar is hard. If English is your native language, you probably don't have much trouble conversing and communicating with others. But even lifelong English speakers have trouble with certain elements of grammar. Here's where our program can help. We know that English grammar can trip you up sometimes. The standard deviants have scoured the nation for all the basic grammar information you need to know and then hired some awesome English teachers to help us out. You can count on us to simplify this grammar stuff and make it easier to learn, easier to remember, and pretty enjoyable to watch. Believe it, it's our job. In part one of this two-part series, we'll cover the parts of speech, which include nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. Then we'll learn the right way to put together all these different parts into one perfect whole what we call sentences. Now keep in mind that you've got a remote control. This means that you're in charge of this video that you're watching. However, anytime you get overwhelmed with stale cliches, practice makes perfect. Or feel like slowing down, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Rewinding or stopping the tape, feel free to do so. No pain, no gain. Remember, we're on videotape and you're in control. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Now let's find out what this grammar word means. Part 1. What is grammar? English grammar is how the parts of our language fit together to make sentences. So the way we correctly combine both words and punctuation is how we use grammar to communicate effectively with others. Now, when you're talking with your friends or during other informal situations where the pace of speech is fast and furious, perfect grammar is not so important. Say you're chatting with your buddy Jen at the coffee shop. She's talking, you're talking, the waiter asks you how you like your decaf choco macchiato. The last thing you're worried about is whether you're using the past perfect tense correctly. You can see that using words without grammar is kind of like playing music with the notes all messed up. It's just word noise. So. When we want to appear professional and businesslike, we use what's known as Standard Edited American English, or S-E-A-E. -E. It's what you may have heard called uh, correct grammar or school grammar. <laughs> it's the dialect you'll find in textbooks, most magazines and newspapers, and in business letters and memos. Let's break down S-E-A-E, -E, Standard Edited American English, so we know what we're talking about. Standard. This is established language that we've all agreed to use. Edited. This implies that we're discussing a written grammar, something you've taken the time to write down correctly. American English. Pretty self-explanatory. We use this dialect here in the United States. It's not the English written in Great Britain, Australia, or New Zealand, but it's pretty close. Now let's make a distinction between grammar, grammar. and vocabulary. vocabulary. Grammar is how the words fit together in sentences, and vocabulary concerns the words themselves. So using good grammar is not a case of using long, important-sounding words. Saying, please oculate that I am self-propelling this double-wheeled transportation vehicle without the assistance of my upper limbs, yon giving birth to me woman, is no better than just saying, look ma, no hands. Remember, writing is a process, so don't make yourself crazy fretting about grammar when you're first writing your ideas down. Deal with it when you're editing your work. If you need some help on the whole writing process daily, check out the standard deviance on the wrinkle-free world of English composition. It'll help you get your thoughts down on paper. Now that we have a general idea of what grammar is, let's get more specific and tackle the things that constitute grammar, the parts of speech. The parts of speech. For ease and comfort, we usually place words into different groups based roughly on their form and function. The different groups are nouns, pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. Nouns. Pronouns. Adjectives. Verbs. Prepositions. Conjunctions. Articles. Interjections! Don't worry, we'll cover each one separately, so you'll be sure to understand them all. 
In this part, we'll discuss some of the most important parts of speech, the nouns, the pronouns, and the adjectives. So let's dive right in. Our first fun part of speech, the nouns. Section A, nouns. We'll start with nouns. You know nouns, even if you don't know them by name. Mrs. Kowalski, gecko, classroom, desk, and trouble are all nouns. Let's look at some of these a little closer to see what makes them nouns. Mrs. Kowalski, she's a person, so that's a noun. Classroom, that's a place, so that's a noun. Then we have desk, well that's a thing, so that's also a noun. Okay, now trouble. A little tricky this one, but it's sort of a concept, so it counts as a noun. We can put nouns into four categories, each one more exciting than the last. We've got common nouns, proper nouns, compound nouns, and collective nouns. The first category is the common noun. Common nouns are nouns that are, well, common. Another way to think of a common noun is that it's just one of a class of things. Here's how it works. Gecko is an example of a common noun because gecko is just a general word describing these frisky lizards. Some other common nouns are pencil, eraser, chalk, dictionary, and map. Here's something interesting about nouns. They can be singular or plural, but what does that mean? Well, if we have just one of a particular noun, then it's singular. One pencil, one dictionary, or one map. They're all singular nouns. But say we have four pencils, three dictionaries, and two maps. Well, those are all plural nouns, because there are more than one of each. So singular, just one. Plural, more than one. The grammar gods have a particular name for the singular plural thing. They call it a noun's number. Kind of freaky, huh? Now, it's not like all these nouns are on some team together and they all need different numbers like 88, 12, or 26. Remember, a noun's number is either singular or plural. So take notice of this because it becomes important as we learn more. Okay, back to the different types of nouns. The second category of a noun is the proper noun. We use a proper noun when we refer to a specific person, place, or thing. So teacher is just a common noun. But Mrs. Kowalski is a proper noun because there's only one Mrs. Kowalski. Thank goodness. Now notice how Mrs. and Kowalski both start with a capital letter. This is our grammar guide. You can recognize a proper noun because it will begin with a capital letter. Some other proper nouns are White House, Washington, D.C., Abraham Lincoln. Sometimes two nouns like to get together to make a bigger, bigger better, better noun. Once this happens, the words act like one thing. We call these new creations compound nouns. Compound nouns are the third type of noun. So to this point, we have the common nouns, proper nouns, and now compound nouns. Now, there are three varieties of compound nouns. One, they can be left as two separate words. Two, they can be connected by a hyphen. Or three, they can be smashed together into one big word. Let's look at each one. First, you'll often see compound nouns as two separate words, like monkey house or bicycle trail. Look at bicycle trail. These two words are considered one noun because together they refer to one specific thing. The second way to write a compound noun is by joining them with a hyphen, like six shooter, night light, or 32. We end up with the same result, a compound noun. We just used a hyphen. Hyphen? A hyphen is just a little dash that connects the two words. And finally, the third type of compound nouns, the one big word type. Sometimes when compound nouns are used for a very long time, they eventually merge to form one word, like classroom, songbird, and basketball. Here, two nouns join together to become one bright and shiny new noun. So those are the three types of compound nouns, two words, two words connected by a hyphen, and the one big word. Now the fourth category of nouns is the collective form. This is when you put a whole bunch of nouns together, but refer to them all by one noun, which is singular. Okay, an example will help you out. Take the members of a family. You can have nouns like mother, and brother, and father, and sister. But when we join them together, we can call them a family. So family is a collective noun. 
and when we use the noun family, we consider it a singular noun. We say, the family loves going to the beach. This is an important point to keep in mind for later on when we talk about using these nouns in a sentence. So remember, even though collective noun usually refers to many different nouns, it is still considered to be singular. So now we know the four forms nouns can take. Common, proper, compound, and collective. So now we know the four forms nouns can take. Common, proper, compound, and collective. We love nouns, and they're great things to have around when you're writing a sentence. But wouldn't it be nice if we had a word that could replace a noun so we don't have to use it over and over again in a sentence? We do! It's called the pronoun. Section B. Pronouns. A pronoun is a word we substitute in the place of a noun. Again, a pronoun is a word we substitute in the place of a noun. Pronouns, what a great invention. Who knows what kind of lives we'd lead without them. Hmm. Sean was wondering if maybe Katie would share some of Katie's paper with Sean. <laughs> For instance, if we take the sentence, Stan is at the soccer game, and follow it up with, he likes to play soccer, we've just used a pronoun. It's he. Instead of saying, Stan likes to play soccer, we replace Stan, which is a proper noun, with a short, sweet pronoun, he. So a pronoun is a short word that takes the place of a noun. The example we just used, replacing Stan with he, is just one example of a pronoun. There are several kinds out there, because we use different pronouns for different situations. We'll discuss three broad types of pronouns. The personal pronouns, the possessive pronouns, and the demonstrative pronouns. First, the personal pronouns. The personal pronouns are the ones you're probably most familiar with. The most common personal pronouns are I, you, he, she, it, we, and they. They refer to a specific person, place, object, thing, concept, or idea. What do we mean by refer? Check out these two sentences. Susan drives to work, she takes the expressway. Who are we referring to in she takes the expressway? Well, Susan, of course. Here's what's going on. The personal pronoun she in the second sentence refers to the proper noun Susan in the first sentence and also takes its place in the second sentence. If we didn't have pronouns, we'd have to say, Susan drives to work. Susan takes the expressway. Sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? So that's the personal pronouns. Now the possessive pronouns are the second type of pronouns we'll cover. These guys do double duty. They take the place of a noun like before, but they also show possession. You know, ownership. In other words, something belongs to someone. So when something belongs to someone, we can describe it using a possessive pronoun. The most common possessive pronouns are my, mine, your, yours, his, her, hers, its, our, ours, their, and theirs. Here's how they work with our chart. My and mine go with I. Next, your and yours go with you. So far, so good. His goes with he. Her and hers go with she. And its goes with it. Now we're going to the plurals. Our and ours go with we. And their and theirs go with they. These pronouns can work in two ways. One, they can pair up with whatever is being possessed, or two, they can replace a noun entirely. Here's an example that'll help you understand. Take the sentences, is Snappy his turtle or Charlene's? I believe it is hers. Believe it or not, we've used a possessive pronoun in each of these two sentences. In the first sentence, is Snappy his turtle or Charlene's? The pronoun his is right next to the thing being possessed, in this case, a turtle. Then in the second sentence, I believe it is hers, we let the possessive pronoun hers stand alone. But notice that we're still referring to a turtle. Either way, we've used the possessive pronouns correctly. So far we've learned about personal pronouns, which replace a noun, and possessive pronouns, which both replace nouns and show possession. The third kind of pronoun is the demonstrative pronoun. Demonstrative sounds like they demonstrate. Well, they do. These pronouns specify exactly which noun we're referring to. It demonstrates what noun we're talking about. The most common demonstrative pronouns are this, that, 
these, and those. We usually use demonstrative pronouns when we point to something like this, that, these, and those. Let's take a crack at another sentence. This is her favorite bicycle. This is a demonstrative pronoun. This tells you which particular bicycle is her favorite and then takes its place. So, instead of saying it is my favorite bicycle, we've specified which one it is. We have two singular demonstrative pronouns and two plural ones. This and that are the two singular demonstrative pronouns. These and those are the two plural demonstrative pronouns. Use one of these singular pronouns when you're replacing a singular noun and use one of these plural pronouns when you're replacing a plural noun. Now you know the three main types of pronouns. Personal pronouns, possessive pronouns, and demonstrative pronouns. There are two general things to keep in mind about pronouns. One, when using pronouns, be sure you're clear about what noun you're referring to. Two, be sure to use singular pronouns with singular nouns, plural pronouns with plural nouns. Very cool, Grammar Buddies. Let's review. First, nouns. A noun can be a person, place, thing, concept, or idea. There are four types of nouns. Common nouns like gecko, desk, and pencil. Proper nouns like Mrs. Kowalski, Washington, D.C., and Abraham Lincoln. Compound nouns like bicycle trail, 32, and classroom. And collective nouns like family, team, and audience. Pronouns. A pronoun is a word that takes the place of a noun. It refers to the noun. We learned about the personal pronouns, I, you, he, she, it, we, and they. The possessive pronouns, my, your, his, her, our, and their. And the demonstrative pronouns, this, that, these, and those. Okay, now we're going to build on some of the things we've learned about nouns and pronouns. Remember how we said a noun can be singular or plural? You do? Good. We called it the nouns number. And you remember how we said that as far as pronouns go, you need to use singular pronouns with singular nouns and plural pronouns with plural nouns? Excellent. Let's expand on this a bit. As you know, we can have the singular pronouns I, you, he, she, and it. The plural pronouns are we and they. Each of these represent a possible subject of a sentence. So in this context, let's refer to I, you, he, she, it, we, and they as subjects. The grammar experts use more technical language for each of these kinds of subjects. And guess what? It's really not difficult to understand. Let's go back over each. Again, let's make the distinction between singular and plural subjects. I, you, he, she, and it are all singular subjects. There's just one of each of them. So let's label all of these singular. Over here, we have we and they. There are plural subjects. There's more than one of each of them. Let's label these plural. Okay, now we're going to take our singular subjects one at a time and tell you what its technical name is. I. That's called the first person. Makes sense. You. That's called the second person. Now he is considered the third person. Guess what? She is also called the third person. Ditto with it. It is also called the third person. So, since these guys are all considered the third person, let's group them all together. Now we just have one more thing to do. Since these are all singular subjects, we add the word singular to the end of them. Let's see how it works one at a time. I is called the first person singular. First person singular! You is called the second person singular. Second person singular! He, she, and it are each considered the third person singular. Third person singular! There. Now we have all of our singular subjects. Let's take a crack at the plurals. All right, we're going to find out the technical names for these two guys. We will start with, well, we. We is considered the first person. Fair enough. They is considered the third person, and that's all good, too. Now, let's remember our other step. These are the plural subjects. That's because we're talking about more than one of each. So, we is called the first person plural. First person plural. And that makes they the third person plural. Third person plural. Now, there is another subject out there, the second person plural. It's sort of like saying you and you and you. You might know it better as you all, y'all, or even 
Use guys. The second person plural is used a lot more in everyday conversation than in our standard edited American English, so we really won't refer to it too much. The grammar guide, then, is that a noun's number is either singular or plural. The noun that we care about in a sentence is the subject. This is the important one. It's the noun that performs the action. And the subject is the noun that gets hooked up with the verb. Now, our little verby must fit in nicely with the subject, though. Now let's take a look at an unsung hero of the grammatical game, the adjectives. Green field. Crowded car. Beautiful park. Fun slide. Dirty water. Ew, wet shoes. Section C. Adjectives. Hey, let me ask you one question. Sure, what do you need to know? What exactly do adjectives do? Adjectives describe. Oh, okay, but what do adjectives describe? Adjectives describe nouns and pronouns. Oh, thank you. So we now know that adjectives describe nouns and pronouns. Let's take a look at how adjectives work, and things should be crystal clear. Kathleen bounces the ball. That's a perfectly good sentence, but let's see if we can jazz it up with some adjectives. What can we say about the ball? Well, it's big, that's for sure. And it's red. And it's plastic, too. Let's use those words in some sentences. How about Kathleen bounces the big ball? Or Kathleen bounces the red ball? Or even Kathleen bounces the plastic ball? Pretty good. Now the words big, red, and plastic are all being used as adjectives. Each of these words describes Kathleen's ball. We can even combine our adjectives and say, Kathleen bounces the big red ball. Or even, Kathleen bounces the big red plastic ball. So Kathleen doesn't just have a ball. She has a big red plastic ball. Or, let's make that a big red hard plastic ball. That's how adjectives work. They give us more information about a noun or a pronoun. Now notice how, in our sentences, the adjective comes before the noun they describe. We didn't say, Kathleen bounces the ball red big, did we? That doesn't sound right. So make it a grammar guide. Adjectives usually, but not always, come before the noun or pronoun they describe. So now you have a basic understanding of how adjectives work. But let's see how someone with a little flair can use adjectives. Step right up, folks. Step right up. If I can guess your weight within five pounds, you'll win great prizes like this wacky yellow bat and this soft plush raccoon and this totally useless tiny lampshade. Oh, the incredible marvelous fun you'll have. Say, nice adjective use. We had, for instance, the adjectives wacky, yellow, soft, plush, useless, tiny, incredible, and marvelous. Now, not all adjectives are this exciting, however. You know those tiny little words, the, and, and a? Uh? They're actually adjectives, too, because they tell us a little tiny something about the nouns we use them with. We call these teensy adjectives articles. Not articles like you read in a newspaper, but a different kind of article. Let's see how they work. The prizes, folks. A bat, a raccoon, a lampshade. The fun you'll have. Yep, those articles are short and bland, but they are adjectives. Another kind of adjective is a demonstrative adjective. Remember when we discussed pronouns and we talked about the demonstrative pronouns this, that, these, and those? These same words can be used as adjectives. How can that be? Well, instead of replacing a noun in a sentence, they describe it. Remember, adjectives describe. Remember the sentence, this is her favorite bicycle? We talked about how this functions like a pronoun because it replaces the actual bicycle that we're talking about. Now, let's rephrase the sentence. This one is her favorite bicycle. This is now in front of one and, in fact, describes it. Sounds like an adjective to me. And to me. And in our sentence, we call this a demonstrative adjective because it tells us which bicycle. Which bicycle? This one. 
So, what have we learned about adjectives? We know adjectives add zip and zing to our hard-working nouns and pronouns. Adjectives describe nouns and pronouns. Articles are tiny adjectives like a, an, and the. And finally, we can use our demonstrative pronouns, this, that, these, and those. We have all these nouns, pronouns, and adjectives floating around in our heads. Now we need to do something with them. Part 3. Verbs. Verbs make sentences move. A verb is the action of a sentence. A verb can walk, run, jump, sit, look, listen, eat, wave, talk, or just let it be. Section A. What is a verb? A verb is a word that shows an action or describes a state of being. It tells us what all those nouns and pronouns are doing in our sentences. A verb is one of the most important parts of a sentence, but it can be one of the trickiest. In the short sentence, Dave runs, runs is the verb because it tells us the action that Dave performs. What does Dave do? He runs. In English grammar, verbs change form to show who performs an action. And who performs action? I do, you do, he does, we do, they do. Take a closer look at the verb to run. We say, Dave runs, but we say, I run. The verb is changed because someone else is performing the action. We can go to our subject chart and fill in the verbs. So we say, I run, you run, he, she, or it runs, we run, and they run. What we just did, taking a verb and seeing how it changes with different subjects, is conjugating. Let's say it again. Conjugating! Okay, now, there wasn't too much change there when we conjugated the verb to run. But if you want change, we got your change right here. Let's try the most common verb there is, to be. To be is a tricky verb. In fact, when we conjugate it, you may not even realize it as the verb to be. <laughs> That's how much it changes. We say, I am, you are, he, she, or it is, we are, and they are. Now look at our little setup. First we have I, then you, then he, she, it. Notice anything? Well, yes, they're all pronouns, but remember how we called them subjects. I, you, he, she, and it are all singular subjects. There's just one noun being referred to in each. But then we get down to we and finally they. Aha! These are plural subjects. They refer to nouns that have more than one member. This goes back to our discussion on a noun's number, whether it's singular or plural. This becomes even more important now that we're dealing with verbs. That's because a singular noun takes a singular verb, and a plural noun takes a plural verb. Let's look at exactly how this works. Okay, let's take Mrs. Midori here. There's only one of her right here. So Mrs. Midori is a singular subject, and we can say Mrs. Midori yodels. Yodels is the verb. It's what Mrs. Midori is doing. So, yodels is the form of the verb yodel that we use with this singular noun, Mrs. Midori. Now here we have the Midori sisters, Elsie, Gretel, and Heidi. The Midori sisters is a plural noun, because there's more than one sister, so we should use a plural verb. Let's try the Midori sisters yodel. In this case, yodel is the plural form of the word yodel. So remember our grammar guide here. A singular noun takes a singular verb, and a plural noun takes a plural verb. Here's how to yodel conjugates on our chart. I yodel, you yodel, he, she, it yodels, we yodel, and they yodel. Verbs also change forms depending on what point in time the action is happening, and we call these changes tenses. We're going to teach you all about them. Section B, Verb Tenses. As we said, verbs change forms according to what tense they're in. This is the point in time the action is happening. We'll discuss 12 verb tenses, but don't wig out, it's not all that bad. There are basically four main ones, the simple, the perfect, the progressive, and the perfect progressive. And there are three versions of each of these, the past, present, and future. See, the tenses aren't so bad. Okay. When we discuss tenses, we're talking about time. Let's say this line right here shows time. Let's call where I am the present. 
That's right now. Over here is the past, things that have happened already. And over here is the future, things that will happen. With that in mind, let's begin. The simple tenses. The first three tenses we'll discuss are the simple tenses. They're called that because these are the simplest forms verbs can take. The three simple tenses are the present, past, and future. Take the verb to chop. Let's construct a present tense sentence with this verb. Usually, we don't have to change the verb for present tense, so we can write, I chop all of my vegetables. This is an action I'm doing right now. It's right here in the middle of my timeline. Now, suppose I've already cut up my vegetables. Well, that's here in the past, so we use a different form of the verb. We use the past tense. It's already happened. Most times, all we